Yeah. In the fall of 1880, James White, you know him, husband of Ellen White. In the fall of 1880, writing to a friend, one morning, I imagine it's one beautiful morning, Michigan, western Michigan, sun is rising. I was inspired by this yesterday as we were finishing our session and we opened the windows and the rain was over and the sun was shining through the windows. Isn't that amazing? In the fall of 1880, James White is sitting there one morning looking out at the east rising sun over the pastures of western Michigan. This is not history. This is imagination, Lisa, if you're listening. I know. You historians. Uh, did that really happen? I don't know. I'm imagining it. But what happened next, we know happened because he wrote to a friend, James White. He said, I have an unutterable yearning of the soul for Christ. He was about to die. A year later, he'd be dead. 17 years of leading this young denomination. We've been organized for just 17 years. He suffered a stroke at the age of 44, no doubt from overworking himself, pastor, neglecting his health, staying up late Friday nights, getting that sermon ready, plank in my eye. <laughs> a year before his death, James, one morning, looked out his window, and he remembered what we are about. I have an unutterable yearning of the soul for Christ, he wrote to this friend. See, when we began, when we began, we were about one thing. We had one doctrine. We were a one doctrine movement. The coming of Jesus, a yearning to be with him. When Miller and his followers gathered that one day, waiting for Jesus to come, we didn't have Sabbath. We didn't have a correct understanding of the Trinity. Uh, scandalous what we thought about the Trinity. Joseph uh, Bates, one of our pioneers, called it an absurdity. The Trinity. Later, Uriah Smith, this is like 50 years later, 40 years later, writing, he said, the Trinity, Holy Spirit, that's not real. <laughs> Wagoner, who we love because of what he did in 1888, uh, he said, Jesus, Jesus became, he was born, and that's when we first met him. That's, he had no no previous existence. <gasps> this is scandalous. Before we had any of this correct understanding of that, before we understood that eating pork, pork, pork <laughs> is bad for you, <laughs> and eating marmite is good for you, <laughs> man, before we had any of that, there were Adventists who went to their grave believing, eating pork sandwiches and believing that Jesus was not eternal and that the Trinity was not real. Before we had any of that, before we had organized conferences and unions and schools and colleges and, and an organized ministry, before we had statements of fundamental belief we've been going through right now, we had just a simple one doctrine movement. It was Jesus is coming, a yearning to be with him. Our doctrines were unofficial until 1830, 1931, 60 years after we were organized. Someone said, we should write down what we believe. And those were unofficial until 1980. Some of you have been born, like, this, our denomination is 120 years old before we actually said, we should put something down on paper. Before that, we had one doctrine. One, before anyone moved to Western Australia, to Perth, to Perth, <laughs> and brought the message here, we had one thing. We had an irresistible, an irrepressible, an obsession to be with Jesus, a yearning of the soul. This is Adventist eschatology, quite simply. I desire to be with him. Miller, when he was disappointed, a month and a half after his second disappointment, you'd learn your lesson. He wrote this. Many of you know this. I have fixed my mind upon another time 
And here I mean to stand until God gives me more light, and that is today, 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 until he comes and I see him for whom my soul yearns. What does your soul yearn for today? Well, I was just invited to this one project thing. It's a novelty. I'm a, I believe in new things, and I want to taste everything that's new. And now your soul yearns for the Christ. What does our church yearn for today? We're not the first ones. The disciples are standing on a hill as Jesus ascends to heaven. Here's, I, love this, I love this picture that Acts 1 paints. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, You've got to imagine this. Like with, they, they're emotional. The one they've been living with, the one they saw heal, and the one they, that spoke hope into their lives by saying, you are blessed, you are blessed, you are blessed, you are blessed. The one that said, it's not okay that everyone's going hungry today, Beck. It's not okay. Let's feed them. He's like a Hispanic mom. My mom's Hispanic. She's not okay with anyone going hungry. And she'll find you. She'll scan a crowd like this, and she'll go, hungry, 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 hungry. Feed them. The one that fed you, the one that spoke life into you, the one that gave you forgiveness, the one that healed you, he will come again. But they're standing there looking into the sky, already yearning for Jesus. Seconds after he's gone. We're not the first ones. James wasn't the first one. William wasn't the first one. Ellen wasn't the first one. We're part of a long tradition of people who have been yearning for the one. The one who wrote this, he said to John, the revelator, write this down. I'm going to tell you what it's going to be like. Do you want to know? There is no temple there, Revelation 21, because God and Jesus the Lamb, their presence permeates everything. Does your soul yearn for that? The light... The light is the glory of God, and its lamp is Jesus, the lamp. Jesus. The throne, there is a throne. The throne is of God and Jesus, the lamb. Food, abundant. I love the references to food. The tree of life planted on each side of the river. There's water of life. It produces 12 kinds of fruit, mangoes and guavas. Come on. Amen, amen, yes. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Revelation 22. The gates of the city are never closed. There's no death, no illness, no mourning, no tears. I am tired of people dying. Dillas, two words, stop it. Stop dying, people. Stop it. Never again to hear a diagnosis pronounced over you like a sentence you have to live with for the rest of your life. There's racial equality there, gender equality there, no poverty there, no violence there, no consumerism there, Brandon. Disregard for the created order does not exist there. Kindness, justice, truth, grace, love, peace, righteousness, and the presence of the Holy One, the substance. Tony, he was changed. He became one of us for eternity. He took our nature. Therefore... He will be there, standing before us. Not some concept, some ethereal thing. It'll be Jesus. My Jesus. You'll be looking at him when you sing that. It's not just weird. Do you think about that? <laughs> Do you think about that? That it'll be the substance of the Christ present, and we will sing to him without silly screens. You better not look at a screen. How would you look at a screen when he's looking at you? That's what we yearn for, for him. The one we sing to, the one we worship, the one we embody, the one we enthrone, the one we love. That's the picture that John the Revelator paints. It is, as one author puts it, it is vast, panoramic, and it exhausts the minds of mere mortals. It is a glimpse, another author says, Michael Gorman, it is a glimpse into God's future that summons us to bear concrete witness to it now. We pray this 
your kingdom come, your will be done. What we're asking is for a collapsing of all that is up there, here. This is not denying that there is up there and that we want up there and our soul yearns for that, Jesus. We want that. But it does mean that we are, if we're being faithful witnesses to all of that, we're trying to enact it here, here, here. Every time you go to the, to the beach with your friends, your youth, and you sing songs to Jesus, and you, you sense something else happen, something transcendent, you're enacting the kingdom. Every time you feed or clothe or care for the hungry and the, and the sick and the widows and the aliens within our gates, they, you are enacting the kingdom. We are enacting the kingdom. Our pioneers knew this. And although they may not have had all this language for it, they did, which is why they built hospitals first. I grew up in Nicaragua, and here's what the layout of our campus looked like. We moved in, we haven't, so it's we, we moved in and we built a hospital first, a clinic. Then we built a school. And finally, we built a church. Our pioneers knew this. Even if they had the language for it, they knew this is what we do. We build a sanitarium, then we build a factory to make food for them. Food that is good and makes you healthy, although I'm not, still not sure about Marmite. Is that good for you? I don't know. <laughs> I get really thirsty after I eat that. Why is that? <laughs> it is a glimpse, this picture of heaven that John the Revelator paints, that Jesus gave him. It is a glimpse, a panoramic view that exhausts our minds, but it also summons us to bear concrete witness to it now. Is there any tangible proof in our churches, in our lives, in our families, in our communities, that this Jesus that waits for us in the future is also our Lord now in the present? Does His radiant beauty and love exist in our churches now? The Rubinos, Sean Rubino, my friend, I work on a campus and I get to meet really wonderful people that are um, in love with Jesus and enacting the kingdom of Jesus here. And the Rubino said, Sean came to me one day and said, I'm in love with this girl. I think she loves Jesus as much as I do. Um, would, you, would you please officiate our wedding? I said, sure. So I put him through the thing that I do, six sessions, and we talk about it. And at the end of the six sessions, these are just wonderful. The kind of people you want, like this is how we want our kids to turn out. This is how, you know, uh, just Jesus loving uh, beautiful, and they said, Sean said to me, I want you to make an appeal at our wedding ceremony. An appeal? <laughs> no. <laughs> you said, well, think about it. This is like, a wedding is like a revelation. 21, think about the wedding feast of the Lamb. This is the point. This is where you can go, just like these people are getting married, there's a day coming. And at that point, we want you to make an appeal. Invite those who don't know Jesus are in love with him yet to come on down. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to do that. <laughs> oh, I, I, oh. Okay, all right, fine. I agreed to this. And then on their, on their, on their wedding day, <laughs> this is awesome. I'm moving towards this appeal, which I've never done at a wedding. It just seems just strange. But hey, these people love Jesus that much. I'm going to do it. Yeah. Um, I'm moving towards this appeal, and Sean forgot to contact, we're outside in the lawn here, there at La Sierra where I work, he forgot to contact the grounds people to let them know that, that they need to turn off the sprinkler system. <laughs> so one of the most amazing and fun things I've ever seen happen at a wedding. <laughs> right as I'm about to, and they're just like the wedding fees of the lamb. I caught out of this side of my, my gaze, the bride's mother, it was like a cartoon, a big industrial sized sprinkler came up right in front of her and began to spray her in the face. <laughs> awesome. You'll never forget your wedding. They won't. Pandemonium, people running, it was, it was so good, it was so much fun. Two years later, God blessed the Rubinos with a baby. His name is Vinny. And Vinny is a sweet boy. He was born with a massive heart defect. Three surgeries. 
Sean quit his job to care for his boy. I've been to every one of his surgeries. They're all, they all begin at 6 a.m. in the morning. So I, you know, I make my way there. And I, I always ask, is the surgeon available at noon? <laughs> make my way there, and I pray with this family. And um, Before Vinny's last surgery, Sean said to me, I'm learning something. God is teaching me something through loving this boy. Yes, he is. Do you know what God was teaching Sean? A year later, um, someone who had been to China brought a picture of a girl who has the exact same problem that Vinny has. An orphan dropped off in some orphanage. And that picture, Alex, that was the I spy for Sean. He saw that need, and all he could think about was that girl. He called her Sabrina. I told him, Sean, I don't think that's her name. That sounds... <laughs> Sabrina. He would call me every week saying, I, I can't sleep. I can't sleep, Sam. They sold stuff. They borrowed money, and they got Sabrina. About six months ago, they brought her to the U.S. And uh, Sean, Sean repeats this to me all the time. Uh, God was teaching me how to take care of a child who needs this. Now that I'm good at it. A month ago, Sabrina went through her first surgery, and we went to the hospital. I went 6 a.m. I showed up, and, uh, and the team of doctors, Dr. Razouk, shows up with his army of experts, world-renowned people, and they're all gathering around the, the, the bed, and they've got, he's got a model of a heart, and he's explaining things no one knows how to say, you know, just... Oh, and we're all kind of bored. I'm like, just get to it. Fix her. <laughs> um, and at, at one point, Razuk lifts his eyes, and he looks at Sean and at Bethany, his wife, and he says, wait a minute. I know who you are. Don't you have another one like this one? And Sean said, we do. Nice of you to remember and Razuk began to weep, the surgeon. And then he said these words to Sean. He said, there is a special place in heaven for you. And Sean leaned over to me and said, it's a place for all of us there. And then we prayed. The surgeon prayed. We held hands, and I opened my eyes because I wanted to see the scene. It's incredible. In the whole operating room, the whole pre-op area, everyone is paused and we're praying. And, and I had this incredible sense that we were enacting in a concrete way the kingdom of Jesus. There was healing there. There was no racism there. There was love and righteousness and justice and every good thing. And the, and the real substance of the presence of Jesus was with us. I yearn, I yearn for Jesus. Nathan, last weekend and I were talking and um, he gave me the words that I've lacked for years now, we do this because we believe in what we're saying. We go away from family and friends and our loved ones because we so believe in what we're saying. Do you yearn for Jesus? Amen.